Welcome to Lecture 10 of ECE 4305 Software Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we will look at how to conduct a quantitative performance analysis of digital communication systems. So as, a, as was mentioned previously, one metric for analyzing the performance of a digital communication system is something called the probability of bit error, otherwise known as the bit error rate, or BER. So what the probability of bit error is, is essentially a probab probability metric that defines how likely uh, a bit error, uh, essentially when a receiver incorrectly um, decodes a one as a zero or zero as a one, within a stream of ones and zeros being received by the receiver from the transmitter. So in order to understand how these errors creep in or to characterize how well or how poorly a receiver um, uh, operates um, given noisy conditions, we need to come up with some sort of mathematical or quantitative um, analysis that uh, using probability theory in order to define what is the probability of bit error. So let's, let's start off with the mathematical framework. Okay? So uh, let's start off with analyzing a modulation scheme. Okay, that a transmitter and receiver have agreed to use, which consists of only two possible waveforms, um, S, I, of T, where I can either be one or two. Now suppose that, um, as we saw before, we have an AWGN channel, additive white Gaussian noise channel, that introduces a noise signal N of T to uh, the transmission S, I, of T, such that the receiver picks up R of T, which is equal to S, I, of T plus N of T. Now the problem is, is that that N of T can sufficiently, can potentially sufficiently cover up how S I of T looks like at the receiver. So really the receiver, when it picks up or intercepts R of T, needs to figure out whether S1 of T or S2 of T was sent by the transmitter. So what we do is we refer to this, um, to this uh, uh, body of knowledge referred to as hypothesis theory. And so what the hypothesis theory states is that we have, let's say, one of two hypotheses that the receiver can work with. Uh, either a hypothesis H1, which means that what is received, R of T, is equal to S1 of T plus the noise across that symbol period, T, or hypothesis H0, that the received signal, R of T, is equal to S2 of T plus N of T. So these are the two possible options that we are picking up over the air. So we have two hypotheses. We obviously have the observation at the receiver of the intercepted signal R of T. What's needed now is something called a decision rule. Okay? We need something that says, okay, I am observing this. I have one of two possible hypo hypotheses to choose from. I need to decide. Okay, so let's make this assumption. Let's, let's say that trans, the transmitter sent S1 of T. And so uh, what we want to do now is we want to use um, that wonderful uh, tool that we used a little bit before called correlation. We want to see how much correlation exists between, let's say, R of T and S1 of T or S2 of T. And, and what I mean to say is, remember uh, earlier on when we were dealing with an alternative representation for the Euclidean min uh, minimum Euclidean distance, and we had that row one, two parameter, and we multiplied two waveforms together and integrated them across the symbol period. What that is, in fact, is a correlation. And as I mentioned before, you can either have uh, uh, waveforms that are totally correlated or anti-correlated. And, and so what we want to do here is the receiver it knows, it, it, are, it has already agreed with the transmitter um, what are the possible symbols that can be transmitted over the air. And uh, what the receiver does is it has a sort of advanced knowledge of S1 of T and S2 of T. It knows that the, only one of those two can be, can be transmitted and we pick up R of T. What we do is we try and correlate S1 of T with R of T and S2 of T with R of T, and which one correlates more strongly. That's why the choice of how the waveform looks like, how S1 of T and S2 of T look like, and how much they differ with each other is so important at this stage at the receiver, because we want to keep them as different as possible, such that our cor correlation values 
uh, don't come too close together. We really want this to be sort of um, uh, apples and oranges. We want them to be as distinct as possible if it's one of the two possible waveforms. So down here we see uh, x of t and y of t. Suppose we want to find a correlation of these two waveforms. All we would do is multiply the, the two together and integrate over the symbol period. So our decision rule, what we want to do is we want to find out how much R of T correlates with S1 of T and how much R of T correlates with S2 of T. Since we're assuming in this case that S1 of T is transmitted, obviously R of T th should theoretically be much more correlated to S1 of T, even with noise introduced, relative to S2 of T. So our decision rule says the correlation with S1 of t should be greater than or equal to the correlation of S2 of t, as we see here in equation one. Okay. So given that, okay, what is the error event? It's when this thing messes up. It's when, in fact, we somehow, our receiver says, oh no, I'm actually, the receive signal is correlating much more with S2 of t than S1 of t. Hmm. So this is what we want to explore, folks. This is what we want to look at and say to ourselves, okay, given that this is when we get the receiver an error, can we now come up with a mathematical framework that says with what probability this bad situation, equation two, occurs? So first thing that I do is I now replace R of t with S1 of t plus N of t in equation two and expand it out as we see here. And since we have like sort of the addition of uh, two signals, we can actually break up our integral into two parts. And then we, we do shorthand. So we know that the integral from zero to t of S1 of t squared dt is actually the energy of this uh, S1 signal. And um, uh, n of t times um, S1 of t integrate from zero to t, uh, that's the correlation of the noise uh, 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 sorry, no, that, that's not the correlation of noise. So that's actually, in this case, it turns out, uh, we'll, we'll figure out in a, bit, uh, in a few minutes what that's equal to. Same thing with nt times s2 of t integrate from 0 to t. We'll look at that in a few minutes. We'll actually create an equivalent parameter that we will call z, that entire thing. And z will have very interesting statistical prop properties because s1 of t and s2 of t are deterministic, but n of t is random. Lastly, what is S1 of t and S2 of t multiplied with each other, integrated from 0 to t? That is the correlation between S1 of t and S2 of t. We've seen this before, and we'll represent it by row 1, 2. So the end result is what we see here in the bottom right, is the symbol energy of S1 minus the correlation between S1 and S2. It should be less than this z parameter, which is the integral from 0 to t, of the noise signal multiplied by the difference in between S1 and S2. So the goal is what is random in that in that expression just that we've just seen? It is z, right? The, um, S1 of t is a deterministic waveform. S2 of t is a deterministic waveform. N of t is random. And where's N of t contain, contained? Only in z. So let's, let's dig a little more deeper. So N of T, we assume because it's an AWGN channel, N of T is a Gaussian random variable, okay? And what an interesting property here is when we integrate a Gaussian, right? So in this case, we have a Gaussian random variable and it's multiplied by a deterministic waveform, so it doesn't matter. So, so basically when we multiply um, a Gaussian by a deterministic waveform, um, it's just a Gaussian, but it, 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 its properties are skewed, but it's still a Gaussian. And then we integrate from zero to t. What is integration? It's a type of sum. What happens when you sum Gaussian random variables? You still get a Gaussian. So it's kind of cool. So what happens is from just, just, just by intuition, just by these simple qualitative uh, observations, we can see that z is also going to be a Gaussian random variable. But now the problem is, sure, that's great. We now know it's Gaussian. What is its mean? What is its variance? What is the PDF? What's the probability density function of Z? That's the goal. So what we need to know, first of all, if let's say 
our AWGN channel, uh, the NFTs are zero mean. That's beautiful because what what's the sum of a bunch of zero mean Gaussian random variables is going to be a zero mean Gaussian random variable. What happens when you multiply a zero mean Gaussian random variable by some sort of uh, amplitude or some constant is still going to be zero mean. But its variance on your hand is going to be skewed and stuff and that's what we need to figure out. So we need to figure out, so we know that Z is going to be Gaussian, so that's the N right here. It has a normal distribution, Gaussian distribution, N, with zero mean. But what is that sigma squared? What is the variance? So we need to calculate that. So the variance of a zero mean random variable in general is equal to the expectation of that random variable squared. So now let's expand out this expression. It turns out that if we apply e to the z squared, okay, to uh, what that expression is for z, we get the following ex uh, derivation. We basically get like uh, because remember that the expect uh, the variance of a Gaussian in the n in this case will be equal of just a regular Gaussian will be equal to n naught over two, and now we have the rest of the deterministic waveform in the integral from zero to t, uh, s one of t minus s two of t squared. And that, folks, now gives us the variance is equal to n naught times e to the minus rho 1, 2, assuming that the energies of the two symbols are equivalent. So there you go. So that gives us now the variance of z. So with the variance of z, this is powerful stuff because now, uh, remember we, we talked about in probability theory portion of this class, we talked about this uh, thing about like, you know, we have the probability density function of a Gaussian. And then I talked about how to cal calculate the probability uh, uh, of, of, let's say, uh, the black box, the random variable producing a value between um, uh, two edges or um, uh, two values um, from that black box. And, um, and in more particular, we, we talked about something called the tail probabilities or the tail of the PDF. So, what we want to do is we know we have z. We have a random variable z. It's Gaussian. It's zero mean. We now know what the standard deviation and the variance are of this Gaussian random variable z. And we want to calculate based on the decision rule, or not the decision rule, but the error situation for that decision rule. We want to calculate the probability of that happening. So we take p, the probability measure, of z being greater than or equal to e minus rho one two. That's the error situation, right? This is fantastic. What does that mean? What is the probability that my random variable z will produce a value that is greater than or equal to e minus rho one two, which is a deterministic value? So basically looking at the bell curve, what is the probability that at the value e minus rho one two we get an output, or what is the area under the bell curve from e minus rho one two all the way to plus infinity? What is the probability of that happening? It's the integral under that bell curve from, the, from that point onwards. And it turns out if we use the q function, it's equal to q e minus rho one two divided by sigma. And so if we now take the square and square root of it, it turns out, uh, through a little bit of mathematical manipulation, what we get is, at the end of the day, um, we, we can now uh, optimize like uh, the, the, the Q function by plugging in, okay, um, suppose we, we have a modulation scheme, uh, just like, let's say, BPSK, where the optimal, the best power efficiency that we got was when uh, both signal constellation points were exact opposite to each other. They're 180 degrees out of phase with each other. Uh, they're polar opposites. So basically S2 is equal to minus S1, which means that they're heavily anti-correlated, which means that rho 1, 2 should be equal to minus E. If you plug that in, we now have the probability of error given that we've transmitted an S1 is equal to Q of the square root of 2 
ev bar over n naught. This is super powerful, this result, because now we have a closed form expression for what is the probability of error. So given some noise density n naught, given some energy per bit, average energy per bit, eb bar, we can now, I can tell you quantitatively what the average error performance will be when I transmit a one. What is the overall total probability of error is when we combine the case when we send S1 and S2 and calculate those probabilities of, of errors for those and we weigh them according to how frequently S1 and S2 get transmitted and that gives us equation 5 and especially if we have like um, um, like you know antipodal signals we can then manipulate rho 1 2 to be equal to minus e and this gives us that beautiful beautiful probability of error that q function of 2 eb bar over n naught when we cannot make assumptions on the energy level of the two signals um, or, or their correlation, we get a more generic um, equation as shown in equation 6, where the Q function of the square root of the minimum Euclidean distance divided by 2 and naught is the solution for, the, for, for this case. All right. So up until now, um, we've been looking at waveforms and, and signals and transmissions and, and such from the perspective, like really from time domain. Um, we looked at signal constellation diagrams and we, we uh, accept this sort of abstract notion of uh, in phase and quadrature planes, the IQ plane and signal constellation points and vectors from the origin out to it and 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 we sort of like you know we, we use those diagrams to sort of graphically represent uh, differences in phase and amplitude and such but let's take this one step further can we come up with a simplified notation where we can abstract um, uh, 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 fr from from these waveforms uh, vector representations based on some common basis functions okay so what we're going to do is we're going to look at another way of viewing and analyzing the performance of these communication systems using something, not the time domain waveforms, but rather we're going to use, instead, we're going to use signal vectors. So we're going to represent any, every one of these signal constellation points. So there's a method behind my madness. Um, and the signal constellation diagrams are a great graphical representation of, of like, you know, sort of like abstracting how um, these waveforms differ from each other. But I also chose it because this is my segue. This is my sort of path towards representing things in a vector representation. And I intentionally chose something like I and Q because we know, just like sine and cosine, which are, 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 are great basis functions in themselves, we know that they're orthogonal to each other and we can represent waveforms uniquely. So, um, so the first thing we need to do is come up with an orthonormal set of functions that form the basis of every possible signal waveform in our modulation scheme. And we, call, we usually refer to these basis functions, basis functions, these orthonormal sets of functions, as phi j of t. And the key property here is that whenever we try and find the correlation between phi i and phi j of t, if j, i and j are not equal, they should be orthogonal. They should be equal to zero. There is no correlation between the two. And when j and i are equal, it should be one. It should be unitary. So they're not only orthogonal, they're orthonormal. Now, um, what we can do is we can represent any s i of t in terms of the weighted sum of these orthonormal sets of functions in order to create that time domain waveform. And those weights, those weights provide us with the coordinate system in the vector space. That's what equation eight is saying. So now that we have um, uh, 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 this, this, uh, this sort of like notion of how to translate from signal waveform space to vector representations, of these um, uh, modulation schemes, these signal waveforms. Let's 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 see how this looks like um, in in an actual diagram. So suppose we we go we, we do we go a little extreme and instead of dealing with two dimensions, we deal with three dimensions. So suppose we have three dimensions, and that's the origin. So zero zero zero. And we have 
one orthonormal basis function representing this axis, we have another orthonormal basis function representing this axis, and we have another orthonormal basis function representing that axis. So what we want to do is we want to represent um, some sort of signal s of t, uh, s i of t, in terms of a vector point, so a signal constellation point. So suppose that we've got that there. So the way we would get, let's say, s i the vector, is s i of t can be represented by s i one times phi one of t. So the projection of s i in the phi one of t axis plus s i two phi two of t. So the projection of s i in the phi two direction plus s i of three phi three of t. And that's the projection or the direction of s i in the phi 3 direction. And so if you now take these bases and do vector addition, what we end up getting is this point. It actually appears in this base, but it's heavily to the side. What we do is, we, 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 if we do a vector addition of these three components, so these three weighted sums, we get this point in space. And that is equal to, coordinate-wise, SI1, SI2, S I three. And so that that folks is how you get a vector representation of a time domain waveform. So we now need a methodology for extracting out um, these weights from an existing time domain signal waveform. And so what we do is we in order to find S I of K, okay, so I S uh, the I represents the, the unique waveform that we're trying to translate into a vector, and k represents the kth basis function that that SIK weight corresponds to. So in order to, to decompose um, uh, the vector into these weights, what we want to do is the following. We first of all take our original time domain waveform, SI of t, and multiply it by a single basis function. Um, so in this case it's a uh, phi L of t, and integrate from 0 to t. Now we know that S i of t can be decomposed into the sum of these weights multiplied by these basis functions, all these basis functions, and then, oh, don't forget, because these are orthonormal basis functions, if we multiply and then integrate from 0 to t, uh, basis functions that are not equal to each other, they should be equal to 0, and when they are, it should be equal to 1, and ta-da, we get S i l. Now, let's look at another very useful property because we're going to be using this a little bit more in the performance analysis. There's something called the vector dot product between S i of t and S j of t. And so what we do is we can represent um, S i of t multiplied by S j of t and integrate from 0 to t. That's a correlation operation. Ah, as S i the vector dot product with S j the vector to give us again the um, the correlation between uh, a waveform i and waveform j, rho i j. Now this is very interesting because remember in, in linear algebra what a dot product does. A dot product is the projection of one vector onto another and that's exactly what a correlation does is how much of one signal, one vector is represented by the other. Okay, And now last but not least we can also find very quickly what the energy of a signal is, SI, by taking the dot product with itself in order to get that value. So, so what happens is, as you see, once we get into the vector space, things like correlation and energy and, and the like are actually very readily um, calculated using very simple linear algebra techniques. Okay. Ah, now Euclidean distance. This all makes sense now. Uh, remember, now we're dealing in vector spaces. So how do you calculate the distance in a vector space? Well, you take its norm, right? So what you do is to find Euclidean distance. In this case, the Euclidean distance or the square is the square of the difference between two signals. What we have here is SI minus SJ. We do vector subtraction, but what we want to do is we want to find the magnitude squared of that. So we, we take the uh, dot, we take the um, difference between the two vectors, uh, dot it with itself, and lo and behold, that gives us 
the same exact answer as what we had before the Euclidean distance and the correlations defined by the dot product between the two vectors. And now if we wanted to compute what the power efficiency is, um, again, we can do everything in terms of the vector representation, but this is this is, it's, cr it's very critically dependent upon the choice of the orthonormal basis functions. They've got to be orthonormal in order for this to all to work. And so we can represent, if we can represent everything in the vector representation, uh, our lives would become uh, quite a bit easier. So uh, what we'll see in the next uh, several lectures is how we can take this vector representation, not the waveform representation, but the vector representation, and be able to uh, translate all our waveforms into this sort of new notation. Um, and we'll also look at tools at how to efficiently create our own vector spaces based on just a collection of waveforms.